Hello, I'm Maria Ressa. Nearly three years ago, well, almost exactly three years ago, Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Jose Antonio Vargas published a controversial essay in the New York Times that fueled fierce debates on the issue of immigration reform in the United States. Vargas was 12 years old when he attempted to live in the United States as an undocumented immigrant. Uh, an e at that point, he became an illegal alien. For years, he worked as a reporter for major news outlets without legal authorization to work in the United States. He's only one of about 11 million undocumented immigrants in the U.S., at least 300,000 of them Filipinos. Vargas has since been involved in the fight for immigration reform. He produced a documentary, he directed and produced a documentary. The title is called Documented. It aired on CNN last Sunday. will air again this Saturday, so if you haven't seen it, make sure you watch it. Joining us now through Google Hangout are Vargas, immigration lawyer Rio Guerrero from New York City, and Akiko Aspiliaga, a TED Aspire speaker. Nonprofit organizations, the Fine American and New York-based organization Next Day Better are also joining the conversation on Twitter. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having us. Hello. Thank you. Jose, let's go to you right away. Pulitzer mm -hmm. Prize working as a journalist yeah. for a very long time. Um, what was the response to the documentary that you that you produced and directed? Um, I think, in general, immigration is the most controversial yet least understood issue in America. So the fact that you have an undocumented person directing a film who's not Latino on primetime television on, in America was just kind of a head-scratcher for a lot of people. Um, and I don't think American television has heard this much Tagalog on primetime TV. I mean, at least a third of the film is in Tagalog. Um, and some actually in Sambal. You know, I, I grew up in Manila, and then my, my, uh, my grandparents are from Sambales. So the reaction has been very, very intense. Um, we actually, I think, broke some records on Twitter just how intense it was on Sunday night. Um, and I think this is such a perfect, which is why I'm really happy we're having this conversation. I think there's, there's, a lot of, um, there's a lot to unpack when it comes to Philippine-American relationships and how it relates to immigration and what it says about our own history, about our own kind of shared history as countries. Fantastic. Look, before we, we talk more about that, let's go to Akiko. Akiko, how has this issue affected your life? Um, being undocumented myself, uh, it has affected it in so many ways. Um, for me, it's difficult to actually plan out a future, and so many times I had to change that plan and just live in a daily basis, um, especially, you know, growing up and being this teenager, a young adult, a lot of the privilege um, that a lot of folks have and don't even have to think about, um, I did not have. And um, I, it was one of the most um, hardest thing that I have to live with. And, um, you know, like I say, I just have to live day by day and keep fighting. Rio, as a lawyer, um, a second generation Filipino uh, American, an American, uh, what advice do you give to people like Akiko and Jose? Well, you know, yes, as a second generation Filipino American, as an, as an immigration attorney, you know, uh, our law firm represents so many of our Calabayans. Many of them are documented, some of them are not documented. And the, the advice, of course, is different for everybody. But for those who are undocumented, you know, for the last 12 years, it's been quite a struggle. Um, I hate having to give this story, uh, give this advice about, well, I, I believe that comprehensive immigration reform will come. Something's going to come. Sooner or later, there will be change and continue to have hope and hold on. But, I mean, that, that is a, a song that's getting pretty tired and, uh, to tell. And each time we get an opportunity for comprehensive immigration reform, people's hopes are arisen and then dashed. Uh, but I still remain hopeful. I mean, I think the numbers eventually will be in our favor. But it is, uh, it's a difficult fight. Uh, on my side, Akiko was saying that there's a certain amount of privilege for uh, individuals who don't have to worry about this, and it's quite true. I mean, it really is. Us as Americans have this great, well, us as documented Americans have this uh, great, uh, you know, right to stay here and, and aren't having to live with those challenges that the undocumented are living with every day. Let me just let me just add. By the way, 
Um, I made I made this film for various reasons, and one of them is to have a conversation within the Filipino and the Filipino American community about privilege, right? Mm -hmm. About how many Filipinos are in America who are American citizens who take that privilege for granted, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, how many Filipinos in America who are U.S. citizens are not even involved in like civic issues in their own communities who don't vote? who aren't even registered to vote, who think of America as just having a nice car and buying a nice house and mm -hmm. setting the like, buy and boxes home and then that's it. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. I think that's a really, really important conversation considering how many Filipinos there are in America and the potential power, potential power that we could have that we're not even using or seeing. Well, you know? Me, it, it, yeah, so I, I just think that's a really important conversation to have. Well, what about why should Filipinos, so you're talking to a, a, a large Filipino audience now. I mean, why should Filipinos care about issues like this right now? Well, I mean, they wouldn't be here if it wasn't for immigration. Why are they here? <laughs> you know, I mean, we are talking about, you know, post-1965 Immigration and Nationality Act, right? I mean, that's when a lot of, Fili that's when my grandparents ended up coming here was because of that. Mm -hmm. And also the fact that Filipinos have been here even before there was in America, right? right. I mean, we were discovered in the, in the St. Louis area in the 17th century. All the mm -hmm. Manos that helped build Hawaii and California. Like any mm -hmm. other group of people, you know, we have we, we, we have claimed the right to be in the Philippines. Never mind, by the way, we haven't even talked about the fact that the Philippines was the first occupied territory. We were the first Iraq. We were the first Vietnam, right? We were, we were a U.S. territory like, like Puerto Rico. But, well, I mean, but this kind of sense of history is not something that we often talk about or even know about. Yeah, and I think it's also, it, it, it begs a discussion of how difficult it is to actually become a green card alone become a citizen. We have the longest visa wait line when it comes to Asian countries. And not only that, like to actually come here with a visa, like my mother, um, working visa, we don't realize how easy it is to fall out of status because there's so many steps to take and there's not enough resources for immigrant communities such as ourselves. And there's a lot of false information that our parents um, follow through and we don't realize that, you know, the advice was false. Well, it's so interesting when, when you look at the stories, you, both of your stories have been on Rappler, and yet there were many comments that actually said, why don't you leave the United States and come back and do the legal thing? It's, in fact, it seemed like most Filipinos who actually had to, do, to go through a legal route, who were documented, are the ones who are most critical. How do you respond to these comments? Go ahead, Akiko. <laughs> Go first. <laughs> um, like, uh, actually, I think the question should be more: How can we stay in you know, the legal way, right? Because my my mom came here with a working visa, and we tried to do it as much as possible by the book, and still we fell out. With that alone, we can see how much there needs to be a change in immigration and its process. And there's uh, Immigration Road um, created this chart, you know, to actually uh, how it is to go from point A to citizenship. And there's so many roadblocks. And like a misfile alone in DHS can be can you can have a deportation order just by that. Interesting. And and too, say, it's I'm too difficult. Sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. Akiko, okay, what, 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 what were you going to say? I think she wanted to say something else. Oh, me? Sorry, oh, Akiko, go ahead. It was cutting. Oh, no. You were I, saying I, that your mom... I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that last part. So you were, you were just saying uh, you, how, your reaction to some of these comments that are, that are critical, that say you should go through a legal route, and if, if it's not documented that you should leave. Right. Um, as I was saying, uh, it's difficult to actually go there from point A to citizenship and um, just like actual experiences of it and all of the things that we need to unpack and unravel with, you know, legal terms itself. Like we don't even know what that means sometimes, you know? Okay. So well, the 
difficulty of the process itself. Jose, for you, I mean, again, just on the same article, there were several of these types of comments. John Shin the third said, Vargas will get deported back to the Philippines, and even President Obama can't and won't help him stay in the U.S. because he falsified documents to get a green card. This isn't the first time we've heard this. We've heard this from hardliners. I'm sure oh, you've heard it. Of course. And difficulties of telling your story. I mean, what? how do you react to this? Well, I mean, look, like, the 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 level of ignorance and misinformation when it comes to this issue is downright oceanic right it's probably as big as deep as the pacific ocean itself and so i can't i only i engage with people who actually ask me serious questions clearly that person that asked that question like it's not like i'm hiding i'm i'm right here talking to you if they wanted to deport me they've had 3 years to do that and the fact that they're not doing that only speaks to kind of the double standards and speak to how broken the whole system is. And I'm sure Rio can talk about this as well. I mean, we have an issue here that our own community, our own Filipino American community that is that has benefited from immigration, that suffers from immigration. This is something we don't really talk about as deeply or intensely as we should. And I don't really know why that is. You know, it it always I mean even within my own family you know, I remember when I, you know, first told my Filipino family that I was going to do this, everybody was scared. Everybody was like, you can't, you can't tell the whole world that you're TNT. You're not supposed to say anything. So why you know? do you think there is such shame to this among the Filipino community? I think a lot of it, too, is we don't know our own history. I think there's mm -hmm. that. I think as a, as, as a culture, I think we've always had a very kind of, you know, let's adapt, let's assimilate, let's kind of let's kind of just blend in, right? Um, there's that feeling of you don't want to rock the boat too much, right? I don't know, you know, where we are a people of, you know, we come from Jose de Sal, right? I mean I've I've been studying the Filipino revolutionaries and what happened with the Spanish American mm -hmm. War and all of that. Like that's where I come from. But for the most part, you know, we're too busy watching singing shows and <laughs> and celebrating celebrities <laughs> yeah. that we don't really want to talk about any serious issues. I will you know, not sorry. Yeah. This is definitely true. You know, again, interesting, you've had your defenders come in uh, on Rappler. Um, someone, uh, this is Des <coughs> Nibunko, wrote, undocumented immigrants pay taxes like anyone else and contribute to the American economy in significant ways. They can't access any of the social services. Uh, they give and hardly receive anything. In reality, you're the, actually the one benefiting from them. This is someone engaging one of the people who attacked undocumented uh, immigrants. Lastly, why blame undocumented immigrants for the difficult immigration system in the U.S.? It's the U.S. government that created the long backlog, arbitrary visa quotas. Rio, do you agree with this? Well, I mean, just to a few of the points that have been touched upon already. I mean, Jose's talking about uh, privilege and maybe a certain amount of hiat within our community. First, to say that, you know, when DACA came out in 2012 and the numbers since then, uh, you'll see that in the Asian community generally, and it's not just the Filipino community, in the Asian, general, Asian communities generally in the United States, there's been a really low number turnout in, in DACA for Asian communities. And I think that goes across the board. So I think it is partly cultural. There's a certain amount of hiat in Asian culture with respect to applying for certain benefits and talking about certain things such as being undocumented. But there's certainly an amount of, uh, of privilege out there from uh, Filipinos who I think, uh, you know, are not fully educated on the issues of immigration law. Uh, there are, uh, you know, potentially four million Filipinos who vote here in the United States. Uh, what I've seen, and I think in part why I, I am actually feeling great hope for our community, is that since the devastation of uh, Typhoon Haiyan, uh, we've seen a community nationally come together on that issue. And it gives me great hope that we can rally around the immigration issue. And, you know, there is, there is a responsibility, Filipino Americans, to give back to the generations that are here and the generations that will come after us because we were given the opportunity to come here to the United States and live our lives whether you're done undocumented or documented and and we have responsibility to our community and I do believe that we're starting to see that flourish in the United States today so we have a chance here if we ride this sort of wave of unity to maybe get some results specifically on immigration law. 
Fantastic. For the three of you, you know, I, I just returned from the United States, and it's so interesting when you talk immigration reform, it is such an emotional issue for Americans. Um, give an insight for Filipinos watching, why is this so difficult, and, and in your words, Jose, so difficult to unpack? Why is it so emotional for Americans right now? Well, because I think it, it because not only is this a country of immigrants, we, are, we in general, this country doesn't know its own history. Right. I mean, I mean, what you're seeing here is kind of a perfect storm of all the demographic and cultural changes that this country is facing. We now have a situation in America where Latinos are the largest minority group, where Asian Americans are the fastest growing racial group. Where how many Filipinos are there in America? About four million of us here. Right. And I think those are just the you know those are just the documented ones. We're not even counting the TMPs. And so I think for many people here in America, given that there's an African American president, right? It becomes a question of our own identity, you know, which is why we started a campaign called "Define American," you know. And I get a, and I get a lot of emails and tweets and Facebook messages from Filipinos in America and in the Philippines who ask me, "Am I, a, you know, am I embarrassed of being Filipino? Like, why am I? Why is the question define American?" I think that's a great question, but to me, you know, I'm a Leia Salonga listening, adobo cooking, TFC watching, Tagalog speaking, Filipino. I'm, I'm, I'm as Filipino as they come. But I think it's possible to be a Filipino American. And that's what I am. I think those two things can exist, right? And I think I have a right. That, that, this is, okay. You, you, as, go ahead, go ahead, continue. As Rio does, as Akiko does, to claim this country. This country that share so much history with the Philippines. Okay. Fantastic. Akiko, you're you're to you, why is this so emotional to Americans? How did your how have your friends reacted to, to you actually telling them about being an undocumented American? For a lot of my best friends, because I grew up in a predominant around my TED talk and they were really shocked to hear that I was undocumented because to them I was just a Kiko, their classmate, you know, somebody who laughed with them, who cried with them and um, to them I was just another person, another human being and for them to realize that I was going through such struggle that it was so difficult for me to actually finish college, for me to be where I am now it never occurred to them and it really broke their heart. I think it also comes down to that you don't know that your best friend or you know, your co-worker is undocumented and I think that really touches a lot of people close to home and I'm pretty sure many of the people out there don't even know that their one of their loved ones is probably undocumented. Jose, uh, you've been so uh publicly uh, available on this, you've been publicly vocal on this issue. What have been the negatives of coming out and telling your story? As you said, you, you could be arrested at any time, right? Or deported is the right word. I, I mean, I think for me, um, just, the, just the personal nature of it, you know, I, I didn't, I really did not want to make a personal film, which is what I ended up doing. And I ended up making a personal film because after all of my travels, you know, you made a point about, for many people, this is an emotional issue. You know, this is the kind of issue where facts just go out of the window, right? And so if I'm going to communicate to people in an emotional way, I need to do an emotional film without being too malal. You know, I love maalala mo kaya, but being too maalala mo kaya, but not being too maalala mo kaya about it, right? Um, so I ended up making that kind of film that kind of showed people what's really at stake, right? So for me, probably the hardest thing is just you know, I had, a, I had a career before all of this happened. You know, I was actually a journalist and a filmmaker before this thing ever happened. Um, and so sometimes, like, uh, dealing with identity and dealing with, like, you know, I um, being seen as, a, as kind of a full human being, you know, capable of mm -hmm. many things, um, that probably isn't probably the hardest thing for me. Um, and taking on kind of a very public role. Well, there are a lot of questions coming in, but a quick question related to that. This is from an American who's watching the Philippines very closely. Damien, on, fr coming in from Twitter, at Czech Irish. Uh, why should people who can't obtain documents legally be allowed to remain in the United States? 
they wouldn't be allowed to stay in the Philippines. That's a great question. And again, that's a question that should be asked to the Department of Homeland Security, right, and the Immigration Customs and Enforcement. Like, I, I love, you know, people on Twitter all the time says me, you know, you should be deported, you should be deported. And I retweet them, and then I add, you know, the hash, you know, like the handle for ICE and for DHS. You know, like this is, we have here a failure of the immigration system. That's what we have, right? And people like me are, more and more people like me are going to come out. So we're all gonna we're all collectively and individually challenging the system that doesn't really know what to do with us except just have all these kind of you know um, non sequitur conversations and blame us for all their like ills and all the problems that they feel like they have. What has failed in the immigration system? Hmm? This is uh, Rio or or Jose yeah. or Akiko. To any of you, what in, in your mind, in your perspectives, in your lives, what has failed in the immigration system of the United States? Well, I, I think uh, there obviously the immigration system and the immigration laws and procedures that uh, govern it uh, have become so complex, um, and and the breadth is so great that it's it's impossible for you to really pick out very succinctly what's failed. But there are certain things that are, are just obviously not working. There's a, a procedure where you enter the country lawfully, but then individuals are not leaving. Um, but then also there is a visa program where you know the individuals who want to come to the United States are waiting 10, 20, 30 years to come to the United States, and for no necessarily good reason, being treated differently by the United States. So there's also failures on in the employment-based side. I mean, a lot of the discussion we have are really is in with uh, uh, family-based immigration, but there's so many problems with the employment-based side. In order for the country to remain competitive internationally, we have to fix a lot of the employment-based immigration. So there's so many things to fix, and, and the bill that was passed by the Senate um, a year ago uh, still remains, uh, you know, unanswered. Uh, the House won't put it up for a vote, and uh, we still can't, uh, we've just got this gridlock that, that is not allowing us to move forward to even start to fix even some of the small things that could be fixed in our process. You know, it's a huge topic to even touch what's going on in the United States today. But let me throw a few other comments coming at you from Twitter from at Alicia Think Girl. Hashtag documented moved me to become even more active in my own community. Thank you for your courage. This is for you, Jose. Um, at Caritas Dacas asks a question How do you restore your sense of agency? I think she means how do you move forward? when you feel confined by your undocumented status. Akiko, why don't we start with you answering that question first? Oh, that's, you know, I ask myself that every day. How, it's, it's really difficult. Um, like for me, I used to say that in spite of my undocumented status, I am still able to go to school, I'm able to tell my story, but I think it's more like because of my undocumented status, because the struggle is so real for me every day, you know, for my mom to be unemployed, for for me to work hard and um, be able to also care for her, like the reality is that I had to grow up so fast and um, I just had to keep I had just have to keep thinking about my family in order for me to just keep pushing and keep pushing so that this label undocumented won't won't be my cage for for my whole life. Do you know what your recourse is? I mean, can you take steps to actually move out of being an undocumented immigrant? Well, right now I'm fortunate enough to be eligible for deferred action for childhood arrivals. So um, I do have my social security number now. I do have a California ID, um, and that's how I've been able to work to help my mom. Um, but you know, it's still it's still not enough because I can't go back to the Philippines um, just to visit my family there. Like it has to be some big humanitarian um, issue or work or school related and it's very difficult to actually go through that process too for me. Jose, you haven't seen your mother in more than two decades. I mean how how has this affected your life? This is your life in many ways. Well I mean I think it's, yeah it is, but I've, I've tried really hard to not let it define me. Right? I mean in some ways I think you know, look, I mean, 
I, I find a lot of peace and a lot of solace in kind of studying history, right? Like what people have to endure, you know? I mean, you just, I mean, I was an African-American studies major in college and that was really incredibly helpful for me to learn about the history of African-Americans who built this country, who are born in this country, and yet for decades and decades and decades were treated as second-class citizens, as slaves of their own country that they're building, right? And so I found a lot of strength in that, in that we endure what we have to endure and it's make it makes us stronger. I mean, sometimes I wonder, would I have been as... Would I have been like this if I didn't have this, you know if I didn't have this kind of monkey on my back all this time, would I have been this successful? I don't know. But uh, I, I, look at, I look at young people like Akiko and I just, my heart just breaks because I, I just hope that, I just hope that people don't give up on themselves, you know? I, I just pray and hope that people don't do that. Um, this is a question from Atsesar Abueg on Twitter. Worst case scenario, do you have a plan B in case you do get deported? Um, for me, plan B would be, uh, I would go back to the Philippines, um, but the most difficult part is I don't know Tagalog that well. I mean, I can speak conversational Tagalog, but I can't read or write Tagalog, so it'll be very difficult for me to uh, go into, you know, employment. But um, Ooh, for me, maybe... Isn't it? Yeah. Huh? Go ahead, Akiko. I was saying how tied it is into identity. Um, where you live yeah. Your life. Yeah, exactly. And and so I just maybe um find another country who will accept me. Just um with all with my degree, with all that I can offer, with my skills and um not just that, but as m my humanity, you know. Um for you Jose, what's your plan B? My plan B. Um <laughs> You know, I've done everything that I've done with, like, you know, with, like, my hands tied behind my back. Sometimes I wonder what would happen if, when there are no limitations. You know, mm -hmm. when I can go wherever I want to go, like, any free human being ought to be. You know, yeah. migration should be a human right. It mm -hmm. must be, and it always has been a human right. When the Spanish took over the Philippines in 1521, when all of these European countries imperialized and colonized their countries, that was migration. Yeah. If they had the right and the freedom to do that, why can't we do the same thing? You could also, I, uh, of course, the United States is a nation of immigrants, and perhaps that's part of the reason it's so emotional. Let me throw a really important question from Christina Pastor of New York. This is to, to Jose. What do you say to those still hiding as TNTs, tago ng tago, still struggling with their unresolved status, still avoiding taking a plane or train where they check government-issued IDs, still looking behind their backs and not trusting people, because they might be reported to immigration. I mean, is there something you can say that will give them a feeling of hope and a sense of optimism? Actually, all three of you, please answer this question. Um, I don't think you can change something you can't face, right? So I've dealt mm -hmm. with this issue since I was 16, mm -hmm. and it wasn't until I was 30, like what, 14 years later, that I was able to actually face it and talk yeah. about it and kind of you know, heal myself in that regard, right? This has been a very healing process for me. So mm -hmm. I don't think you can change something you can't face. And so trying to face it in your own way, within your own, you know, comfort zone, right? Just talking to your own relatives about it. There's so much about Filipino culture in our own families that we don't talk about. I don't know mm -hmm. why that is. Like, we are such a, at, at least in my family, I mean, within my own family, like, there's a lot of sense of hiya, there's a lot of sense of, we don't talk about that, <laughs> you know, um, that really gets in the way of effective communication. Um, so that's one thing I would say. Akiko, your response? Yeah, um, I t really agree with Ho with Jose because um, for the longest time I kept quiet and tried to deal with this myself, but it was when I reached out to people for help that I was able to finally be somewhat free of all of these burdens because you don't have to, cur to carry all of your struggles by yourself. There are people there who will help you. 
um, you know, we can help you. Uh, just reach out to um, one of us and we'll be there for you. And that's one of the reasons why Aspire, um, the organization, is such, is a big part of my life because they were here carrying all my struggles with me and we keep fighting and support each other and if you ever just want to talk about it feel free to contact me you know because we have shared struggles that's that's very generous of you Rio is what is the legal recourse that that people who feel this way who feel like they have to hide what what is their legal uh, I mean I, I love what Akiko said before she said that um, you know if she went back to the Philippines she doesn't really speak it very well she doesn't really write it I mean, that, isn't that what we're talking about, right, with Jose? I mean, define American. Akiko's American, you know, yeah. and to send her back doesn't make any sense because that's really not who she is. I mean, I've heard so many stories over the years, and I've been practicing for about 16 years now, so many stories about, you know, uh, Filipino parents will bring in their 18-year-old uh, son or daughter and say, well, you know, she ju we just told her that she's here unlawfully, and now we can't you know, afford to send her to college, and those stories come up all the time, and the legal recourse that's available to each individual, I mean, again, that, that is unique to each individual, um, but I, I would say that for those who are undocumented, you know, for those who have friends who are documented, or relatives that are documented, uh, you know, you have an opportunity to talk about these stories uh, and get the issues out there. And then, and and hopefully they can use their vote and they can use their voice on your behalf to get movement um, in the community, uh, locally, and and then um, nationally uh, to politicians. Because I think that's the only way you're really going to see change. I mean, there needs to be an education, there needs to be a culture change on this issue across the country before you really see meaningful, comprehensive immigration reform. You're really saying there's nothing, uh, individually at least, that can be done without these reforms, without policy reform. Well, I think that, you know, when we're talking about 11 million undocumented individuals in the United States, okay, and of which there may be approximately 270 or 300,000 Filipinos, um, each case is different, and certainly some of them, if they have their case more closely analyzed, I think Akiko was touching upon the point that Listen, they had legal representation, and the process was so convoluted that even you know their attorney or whoever was representing them still got it wrong. I mean, uh, individuals need to go out there and seek out people who can help them. There are great uh, nonprofit organizations that have excellent attorneys that can give you an analysis of your case, and maybe there is something that can help you. But by and large, yeah, of the 11 million people who are undocumented in the United States, uh, so many of them are waiting for comprehensive immigration reform or a policy change, or, you know, executive action by the Obama administration. Jose and Akiko, from listening to what you guys had to say, I mean, it, it, it touches such fundamental issues of identity, uh, the fight that you're involved in now. Um, Jose, earlier you, you, you said you considered yourself both Filipino and American. How, how do you define your identity now? Well, I'm also gay. I'm also, you know, I'm I'm also somebody who is <laughs> multilingual. I'm also somebody. I mean, I feel like all these identities can exist all at once. You know, why? I mean, it's it's, and I think that's important. I think that's important, and I think it's you know only human to to be able to claim all these identities um, that make up who I am as a full person. So that's that's how I answer that. Can I ask you before I go to Akiko, Jose, you are, have been so open about such private issues. I mean, what have been the negatives for you? What have you had to deal with? What are the costs of being so public in this fight? Um, just to make sure that when I do it, it speaks to the greater universal truth. You know, like that how do you use a specific story to underscore something universal and something that's shared? Right? Like when I made that film, I um, to get through it, I didn't want to think about my mom. I thought about her as everybody's mom, you know, just because it was easier to kind of deal with it that way in the editing room than to kind of think about, oh, that's my mom, and I'm sharing her with the whole world, you know. Like, so I have to. I feel like every day I have to earn saying I, me, and mine, so that it doesn't become this narcissistic, self-aggrandizing, self-serving thing. You know that it that it serves a greater purpose and have a bit, you know greater impact in my life. 
you know, in my own reality, right? Because if I did that, who wants to hear that? You know? The attacks take a toll on you, though, or are you able to push them away? I mean, just no, admit I have, um, thankfully, I grew up in a... <laughs> I grew up in a in a in a in a kind of Filipino household where I was used to being teased, you know. So I have I have pretty thick skin. I have pretty thick skin, so I can I can handle this. Akiko, let's go to you. Uh, you know, again, fundamental issues of identity. It's interesting that you said that if you your plan B, if you were to go back, uh, you don't quite. You wouldn't quite fit in the Philippines. How, how do you define yourself now? You're younger than than Jose and myself. I mean, how do you how do you define these issues for yourself? Um, for the it was it wasn't until recently um, that I started being okay with just being who I am, just being me, and not to have to label myself as undocumented or um, have those sort of big labels be a huge part of my identity. Um, but I think I just, it's just recently that I just started wanted to live as a person, you know? Like, I don't need to have all of these um, social constructions to confine who I am. Um, I think we are all beyond that, beyond, beyond labels, and um, just to accept our whole being. And that's why I said earlier that you know, worse comes to worse, I'm going to find a place where I can just be human. Fantastic. Um, Jose, I want to go back to you. Earlier, I, I misused a term that, uh, that you actually campaigned against. I used the words legal alien. Uh, when you first wrote your, your piece for the New York Times you know, three years ago, this is something that you actually seem to really have pushed. I mean, what's the difference in words? Why stop using illegal alien and using undocumented immigrant? Well, I mean, first of all, it's more factual, right? Like, um, uh, being in this country without papers is actually a civil offense and not a criminal one. So there's that. Um, to be undocumented means not to have papers. <laughs> it, it means not to have a valid U.S. passport, a green card, or a driver's license. Like, that's what it tangibly means. And my travels in the past three years have shown me that using the word illegal has actually gotten in the way of solution and actual reform. How do you legalize people who are illegal? You don't. You call them illegal, end of conversation, right? You're illegal, end of conversation. Yep. And for me, what's been so tragic is hearing people use the, the, the word illegal and Mexican interchangeably. As if there's something wrong with being Mexican, and as if all Mexicans are undocumented, if, as if all of Latin America is Mexico. So, yeah. if you're not Mexican, it's really even more important <laughs> that you yeah. speak out against it and that you call it out, right? Like language matters. I don't want to have to quote George Orwell about this, but language matters because it frames and contextualizes the conversation. So, so some of the other comments I've seen. In, re in reaction to this is that in many cases, undocumented immigrants still requires lying, that you lie to stay in the United States. How do you deal with, with questions like that, and how do you put this together with your own sense of identity? Um, that was, it was very important for me when I outed myself to be very intellectually honest about what I had to do, which is lie. You know, a lot of lawyers, people like Rio, not Rio specifically, but immigration lawyers advised me to not say that I lied on government forms, to not admit that I use a doctor social security card, because that basically disbars me from any sort of relief, like an extraordinary ability visa or something like that. But if I'm going to do this in such a public way and I'm not honest about what I have to do, then why am I doing this? Mm -hmm. I feel like this issue lacks a certain kind of honesty, right? A, a more honest, more truthful conversation about what, why people do what they do, right? Like if you were 16 and you were in my same shoes, what would you have done? Would you have worked? Right? Would you have gone to college? You know, I mean, for me, it's a question of empathy, right? Like, I can't, I can't be kind of on a high horse. Like, I lied. That's what I had to do. By the way, I'm, I am working really hard. I mean, a couple of weeks ago, someone on an airplane asked me. We were having a conversation about this issue, and 
And the gentleman was like, you know, I'm okay with making you a U.S. citizen if you think you've earned it. That was such an interesting question. Interesting. And so I said to him, have you earned it? Have you mm. earned your citizenship? And then, he, he had, and then he said, no, but I was born here. Oh, so it's an accident of birth then. I mean, these are important questions to ask, right? And it yeah. gets, again, to the heart of privilege and to how self-aware people are. You know, I'm fighting for something that most people take for granted. Yeah. Right? That's what Akiko and I are fighting for. Even our own Filipinos in this country, um, which to me is such... Can you imagine if Filipino Americans were actually as civically involved as we should mm -hmm. be as a people? What kind of impact that would actually have? In interesting. Uh, Akiko, you, I hear you speaking... Uh, and nodding, um, uh, what are you thinking about what uh, Jose has just said? Um, the fact that it's so ironic, you know, that um, a lot of folks who can be civically engaged, who have voting power, aren't aren't being engaged, are not uh, politically um, empowered to do so, and it took. It took me um, to actually be in this struggle, to be in this status, for me to do that, for me to aspire for change and work at it. So it's, it really is very, very ironic. And um, it, it begs the question of what does it really mean, you know? What, what, what does citizenship mean? And I think it really comes to redefining that. I mean, but, but, but that was a question from the very beginning. You know, that's why it's called Define American. We didn't call it Define Immigrant. We've actually gotten some calls from people in, in Britain that have been studying our campaign and want to start, like, a Define British campaign. Yeah. I would love to start a Define Filipino campaign. What does that really mean? What does that being means, Filipino exactly. mean? What does being Filipino mean in the, a globalized 21st century in which we as a people, you know, we are, we are among the most dynamic most, the warmest, I mean, I love the warmth of Filipinos. I you miss know? it. There's kind of nothing like it. Um, but as a, but yeah. as a people, like, we have to collectively assert ourselves. Oh, we lost her. Okay, so you've gone through a lot of things in the last three years. What do you want to happen, particularly after um, hashtag, after documented well, I mean, I think at Define American, we're going to continue to insist on a more honest, more elevated conversation on this issue, to take it out of this Latino border, U.S.-Mexico framework that, 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 um, that we've had it in. But also to, to have, you know, I mean, I'm prepared and I'm more than excited to have a deeper conversation among Filipinos around the world about the meaning of being Filipino. Um, and again, as somebody who's a journalist and a writer and a filmmaker, I feel like I'm in a unique position to kind of insist on these stories, you know, and to kind of contextualize this in a much better way. Uh, what does it mean what, for you when you say you want a deeper conversation about the meaning of being Filipino? What does that mean for you? For me, that means owning our own history. For me, that means claiming space. I think that for me, that means being, being proud but also being humble. To me, that means knowing that we have a responsibility to, to our, not only to our families and to our own betterment, but to kind of who, who, who would become us a people, right? I mean, it, it's a tragedy to me sometimes when I speak to my own nieces and nephews. Like, they don't know where they come from. You know, I'm two generations away from being a rice picker in Zambales, from being a fisherman or a rice picker. That, that's, you know, a, 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 I mean, a farmer. That's what I was going to be. You know, and to be grateful, right? I really feel that you find purpose when you find gratitude. And for me, that's where my work started, is when mm -hmm. I started kind of being grateful about what has happened to me and questioning and facing my own life. Fantastic. Akiko, for you, what do you want to happen? Um, you know, just going back to what Jose was saying, I really think education within our community and, you know, talking about immigration in such a deeper manner will really help us, you know, define what it means to be a person and why we exclude other people from uh, other rights that we should have, you know. Um, 
And also, just this week, Obama recently talked about executive action and immigration reform, and it sounded so heavy on enforcement. Like, we need to talk about how can we expand deferred action to include also, you know, folks who just aren't, you know, the young adults. How can we include more people um, to have some kind of relief while, um, while the Congress figures out what they're going to do with comprehensive immigration reform? And Rio, we come to you. I mean, in some ways, that's a question right from Akiko. Uh, what do you want to happen? Well, I'd say specifically we do want to see an expansion of uh, deferred action, certainly. Uh, hopefully it would expand not just to, uh, well, it would expand to the at least the immediate relatives of those individuals who, who have deferred action right now. I'd say uh, there's other things that can be done, yes, in the enforcement side, uh, administratively closing certain uh, deportation cases. You know, the Obama administration does have the op does have the power to, you know, sort of um, close the spigot on deportations or at least, you know, lessen the flow. But more specifically, there has been an issue out there uh, for quite some time, since November of last year, since Super Typhoon Haiyan struck the Philippines. For the Filipino community, temporary protected status, known as TPS, still remains an issue where the Obama administration at this point can take executive action and, and uh, work with DHS to have TPS granted for Filipinos. That would affect all 300,000 or so undocumented Filipinos in the United States today, as well as maybe another 200,000 who are documented, and grant them work authorization and protection from deportation. That still sits on the table or on the desk of Jed Johnson at the Department of Homeland Security. Today, Obama, well, yesterday, Obama said that he wants to exhaust all options or investigate all options that he could bring to bear on this issue. Well, that's something that the Filipino community here, we're talking about uniting the community moving forward. We can push that issue, and if we're successful, we can bring relief to Jose and Akiko and all of the undocumented here, at least temporary relief. And so that's what I would like to see. I would like to see Filipino Americans get energized, seek out their politicians, and push this issue forward. Fantastic. I'm going to just ask you, we're near the tail end, I want to ask you for your last thoughts on this, but this is a fascinating discussion on how you found your voice, defined, are in the process of defining identity, how that leads to policy and nationhood. I mean, it's it's all encapsulated in you. I'm, lo I'm really looking forward, Jose, to seeing your documentary this Saturday. So let's start with Rio, I guess. Your last thoughts. We'll go Rio, Akiko, and then we'll end with you, Jose. Rio, your last thoughts on this. I mean, you talked about now the policy that you want to, to pursue, that you want to push that can give um, short-term relief to people like Akiko and, and uh, Jose. But uh, your last thoughts encapsulate this very huge issue that is both visceral and policy and policy driven. I mean, I, I live with this issue uh, in many ways. Obviously, personally, as a second generation Filipino American, I wouldn't be here today if my parents hadn't immigrated. As an immigration attorney, I represent Filipinos and non-Filipinos every day on their immigration issues. And I see all sorts of different things. On this undocumented issue, 11 million people undocumented in the United States, I still hold hope. I do. I believe that this country will get it right, that it will again remember that the country is built on immigrants, and that the only way we will go forward, the only way we will do right by the, the mission of this country, the only way we'll do right by the people who are here today, documented and undocumented, is to fix this immigration situation. And I think it will happen. I don't know when it will, but my hope is still there. there. It's been too long. It's been over a dozen years since we've seen comprehensive immigration reform. Sooner or later, the levy will break, and there will be change. I cross my fingers for your optimism. Akiko, <laughs> for you, your last thoughts on this complex and, and very um, visceral issue. Um, I think immigration is... A world issue and before we actually you know um, while we tackle immigration reform I think we also need to address the root causes of why we move why people move um, and also to stop thinking about it as a policy but thinking about it as um, being human and what does that mean for each and every one of us is it right to send back you know the Central American children all the way back to their 
homelands where there's so many things going on is that, you know, what we hold a lot of values. And um, I think it's also up to us to start acting with those values in mind and start thinking critically and being more, you know, politically active and more um, informed about world issues that is affecting us. Fantastic. Thank you. And Jose, the man who kicked it all off, started it off, and gave a Filipino voice to this issue in the United States and globally. Your last thoughts? Well, I, I hate to plug the film, but <laughs> the film is also <laughs> going to re-air again on Saturday at uh, 9 p.m. Eastern Time, 6 p.m. Pacific Time. Um, mm -hmm. I have to say that I'm really proud that the film is as Filipino as it is. You see Lumpia, you see my family, you hear Tagalog. It's as Filipino as it can possibly be, um, and I'm really proud of that. Um, also, you know, please follow the conversation. We have a use hashtag documented. I'll be live tweeting the conversation and the broadcast. If you have any questions, please ask me. Um, and I'm really grateful um, to my team, the Define American team. We actually have a Filipina American on our team, Maria Cruz Lee, who's our director of engagement and communications, and she made sure that this, you know, that this happened. So please, you know, follow her on Twitter. She's phenomenal. Fantastic. Okay, it has been an amazing conversation uh, talking to the three of you. Uh, we've been talking to Jose Antonio Vargas, Rio Guerrero, and Akiko Aspeliaga about very personal issues of that they the fights they've been going through, fight for identity uh, and uh, immigration policy, immigration reform in the United States. Uh, it hits us here in the Philippines. Join the conversation. I'm Maria Ressa. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.